by combining 2D sublimation techniques with 3D printing, we can achieve full color photorealistic first layers. This video is your complete guide and there's no special 3D printer required. I love it when I get to showcase amazing work from the community, which is what I'm about to do. Recently, I was contacted by Johan, who shared a video of a 3D print featuring a full color surface, but printed on a regular single color 3D printer. Johan is from nerds.ph, who provide a range of maker services, including 3D printing and prototyping to the Philippines. Johan invited me to try this technique and invited me to make a video guide. And to help, he shared with me detailed results of his own testing. So full credit to him and here we go. This technique uses sublimation. So the first question is, what exactly is that? The definition is when a substance transitions directly from a solid to a gas state without becoming a liquid state in between. And specifically what we're concerned with for this video is dye sublimation. A version of this that's very common is when we take a shirt, specifically one made from polyester, and after printing sublimation dye onto sublimation paper, we use a heat press to transfer the dye to the shirt. As you can see, this process is extremely effective and it's what we're trying to replicate, but incorporating 3D printing in this guide. For those looking to start a business around sublimation, you would typically invest in an industrial quality printer. The trouble is these aren't exactly cheap and you wouldn't spend this much for our experiment. But fortunately we don't have to, a popular method is to take an Epson EcoTank printer and convert it over just like Shaq has here. And the key thing about the Epson printers is they don't use heat during the print process, therefore the sublimation ink won't change states. Now Johan was using one of the fancier ones and you can see they take six types of ink and this apparently can give more control over the exact colors. However, these are pretty expensive if you're just doing this for fun, so we're looking for a cheaper option. If we look at the home and office range, we can see that the prices are a lot better. But don't worry, we can still do better than this. In Australia, the cheapest model is the EcoTank ET1810. It's readily available at the equivalent of $160. US The cheapest model in the USA is the ET2400. From places like Staples and Walmart, you can pick it up for $180. US, and you might find it cheaper new or secondhand on Amazon but I caution against getting a second-hand one because as you'll see, we're not using the regular ink with it. Any machine from the EcoTank range will do, and I understand that many won't want to purchase another 2D printer, but it's worth seeing what this technique can do before making up your mind. We're going to start by preparing our EcoTank printer for sublimation, and in case it wasn't obvious, this will void your warranty. Another thing to note is that the ink that comes with the printer can be sold to offset the cost because we won't be using it at all. However, don't get rid of the bespoke bottles just yet. The special thing about this EcoTank range is that they don't take ink cartridges. Instead, they have ink reservoirs at the front that we fill up just like filling up oil in a car, and the level for each is shown in these front windows. The easiest way to set up the printer is to download the official app. After pairing with the printer, one of the first things you'll be asked to do is to load up the ink. Although of course, we're gonna load up some sublimation dye rather than the ink that came with the printer. Typically, these are gravity filled. However, the top of the ink bottles have a special valve on them that interfaces with the slot and prevents any spills. The problem here is that the sublimation dye bottles do not have the matching nozzle, so we need to do some problem solving. Johan uses 3D printed bottle adapters combined with a 3D printed funnel that goes on the printer to minimize the mess when adding dye. Another common method is to get a syringe and suck up the sublimation dye, drawing it carefully to avoid spills and then pressing the syringe to deposit the dye inside the printer's tanks. Alternatively, you could empty the ink bottles that came with the printer, transferring it into another container before thoroughly washing the ink bottles and their special cap, and then pouring the sublimation dye into the original clean bottles. But in my opinion, what I ended up doing is better than any of these options. I purchased this kit that came with sublimation paper, all of the sublimation dyes, instructions, and most importantly, four empty containers with the specialist top required. So in my case, all I had to do was squirt the sublimation dye into these containers and then pop the container into the top of the filler. Everything from here is automatic. The dye will go down into the storage reservoir and stop automatically once it reaches the top. And when you're done, you pull it up with a special valve preventing any leakage. Nice and clean and nice and convenient. 
We repeat for the other three colors until the app that we're ready to continue. Then you start the initialization process. As far as I know, this primes the inside of the printer with the die. This takes just over 10 minutes, and during that time, you set up your printer's Wi-Fi connection, as well as setting up the printer in your operating system. This was pretty easy, and everything went smoothly for me. Finally, we run the print head alignment. This will print out a page with a number of patterns on a grid, and to complete this calibration, all we need to do is to select which one looks the best from the drop-down menus. The printer doesn't know or care that it has sublimation dye instead of ink inside. It's now ready to go. Let's start with a t-shirt and rekindle the bromance by picking my friend Sam Prentice with me shamelessly stealing this image from his Instagram. I've linked it below, go and follow him. I then pasted it into Photoshop, cut out the background, cropped it, and very importantly, mirrored the image from left to right. As for printing it out, it's just like using any other 2D printer. You just load up sublimation paper and hit print. And then a few seconds later, you and your new sublimation printer will be very happy when Sam pops out to say hello. I chose to cut out the image just to make it easier to center on the shirt, but as you'll see, I butchered that part like I always do. On garments, we put our print face down with a piece of greaseproof paper underneath the top layer of the shirt so it doesn't go through to the back. For your heat press, you're going to set it to just over 200 degrees as sublimation takes place at around 195. You should have instructions on the back of your paper, but for mine, it was one minute at high pressure. And I soon discovered that my heat press is measured in degrees Fahrenheit instead of degrees Celsius. So when I peeled back the paper, the image was way too faint. So I repositioned it, turned up the temperature, went for another minute and got this fantastic result. As you can see, pretty much all of the dye has been transferred onto the t-shirt. And when we remove the greaseproof paper from underneath, the shirt is ready to go. To help justify the price of the 2D printer, you can make your own custom clothing like the Sam Printer Special you're seeing here. But what about the 3D printing integration? The first job is to print off another copy of Sam Prentice. And the printer that I've chosen is the Bamboo Lab A1 because it prints all of the filaments you'll see quite well. Being a bed slinger, it's easy to access the bed. And importantly for me, it has the exact same bed as the X1 and P1 series. Because of this, I have a few spare beds and specifically an engineering plate. All of the other surfaces that Bamboo Lab have seem to be stickers on top of this but whatever coating the engineering plate has, it seems to be directly bonded to the spring steel sheet. It's very hardy and as you'll see, perfectly suited for our purposes. However, if you don't have an engineering plate, I think most beds would still be fine. To attach our printout to the bed, we're going to use regular glue stick. We glue the image, this time face up, directly to the bed. And for this first test print, I'm using white TPU and it's just a big slab of a rectangle to completely cover the image. On printers like this, where the nozzle touches the bed and is used for auto bed leveling, it does so when the nozzle temperature is lower than 195, which means the sublimation dye will not yet be activated. Yet, as Johan discovered with a lot of trial and error, as the printer lays down the first layer, there's sufficient heat and pressure to activate the dye and transfer the image onto the bottom of the print. There are print settings that we need to change to get the best results, and we'll cover those in detail in the next portion of the video. But for now, this was just dipping my toe in the water, which is why it's so ridiculous that I picked such a large image as this print took around four hours. But when the print was done, I pulled back the TPU and was quite excited to find the image transfer was excellent, especially for a first attempt. And I'm so glad that Sam Prentice was here to share it with me. That's the proof of concept complete, so let's go over the best settings. To formulate this guide, on top of all the incredible notes and settings that Johan had given to me, I printed out a grid of Sam Prentices and 3D printed a disc into the middle of each so I could quickly compare back-to-back -back settings. Small changes can make a significant difference, so let's jump in. The first thing we need to do is set up our slicer to have low and slow first layers. For this process, we want a ridiculous amount of first layer squish. We don't want any gaps at all in between the extrusions, or we'll see them in the image. Now some of what you're seeing here is just paper stuck to the surface and you'll find that that and any residue brushes off even under cold water, but any gaps in the extrusion will remain in the finished image. Here I've saved the sublimation profile, so let me take you through the changes. You want your first layer speed for both the first layer and infill to be nice and slow. We're talking five millimeters per second and maybe something around 10 millimeters per second tops if you're impatient. This does greatly increase the print time, but the rest of the print will run at normal speed at least. Your filament profile won't need much change because no doubt the first layer temperatures will be above 195 regardless of the filament. 
but just make sure you have part cooling turned off for at least the first two layers. I tested TPU, PLA and PETG with similar results for each. The prints stick really well to the sublimation paper, so heated bed temperature is not critical. I use 60 degrees or more like I normally would depending on filament. That's the slow, but what about the low? On a Marlin 3D printer, we can just change LZ offset, moving the nozzle down to create more squish. The same goes if we're running a clipper machine, it's very easy to get some more squish. However, I'm on a Bamboo Lab printer and they don't offer direct control of first layer squish, but that doesn't mean there's not a way. If we come to our printer settings and then machine G-code, we can click the edit button for the start G-code and then scroll all the way to the bottom. And here we see a section of conditional G-code adding extra squish for the textured PEI plate. There's nothing to stop us from copying this line and then pasting it just after the conditional section where we can alter this value to increase the amount of squish. You'll need to do some trial and error here, but I lowered mine bit by bit, arriving on a final value of minus 0.12. You don't want this in place for your regular prints, so make sure to save a copy of the standard printer profile dedicated to sublimation. The downside of the first layer being artificially low is you're going to get a lot of additional filament being extruded. This should correct itself over the rest of the print, but keep an eye out for buildup. In this process, the first layer is everything, so it's not surprising that first layer infill pattern is quite important. Quite often, you will see the pattern of the first layer infill in the surface of the sublimated image, and this effect is exacerbated if you don't have enough squish. Based on mine and Johan's testing, the normal monotonic straight line infill has a tendency to slightly under extrude in longer segments, which we can see as gaps. I would suggest changing to an infill pattern, such as concentric, that shortens the extrusions as much as possible. Yet in these examples, we can see in the longer sections at the outside, we start to have the gaps again. A good pattern to try is the Hilbert curve, as no matter how big the first layer is, the infill pattern will remain small and intricate. Sometimes you can still make out the pattern, but generally it's a lot more subtle. When putting down our sublimation paper, glue is messy, but it does work best. I also tried some blue painter's tape to hold down small images, and for small images it seems to work not too bad. However, I did notice that without enough tape, the paper would curl up and the print along with it. Therefore, for best results, and especially if the image is large, a thin smear of glue around the border of the image, as well as a few spots in between, should prove to be quite reliable. Fortunately, the glue does come off quite easily as soon as we introduce some warm water and something like an old card as a scraper. There are some tricks you can use to boost color saturation. You might have noticed that the colors when sublimating to fabric are a lot stronger and more vivid than those we get when 3D printing. To assist with this, Johan recommended sublimation spray, which we would put onto the printed page and that should assist in the transfer of color. And I did try to buy some, but instead they sent me this glitter body spray. At least now, I can always be the brightest star in the room. Fortunately for me and you, Johan had an even simpler solution. As soon as the 2D print was done, take the page, load it back into the machine and hit print once more, printing the exact same image over the top of the first. As you can see, this works remarkably well, with the colours being much more saturated. Note that you might get a slight amount of blurriness if the page shifts ever so slightly the second time it goes through. And with no other changes, this double printing is very effective. Johan also noted that he got stronger colors when using matte filaments. Finally, some tips on positioning the paper and the print to match each other. There's a big variation here in where the disc aligns with Sam's face. And that's because when I was doing my quick testing, I just stuck the image roughly in the middle. Johan's solution was to print a template that would remain on the printer bed and be aligned with a disc inserted into the graphics. He had good success with this and said it could be used several times. My approach was a bit different. I modeled out the maximum size of the bed and then drew this centering pattern in the middle. I then printed this onto the bed in PETG, but without any infill. When the print is done, this should leave a small passageway where you can use a Sharpie to trace the centering pattern. A few times I slipped, but fortunately this doesn't have to be perfect. I chose PETG because even at 80 degrees, it barely sticks to the engineering plate. Therefore, it's very easy to remove the printed template. I would recommend cleaning this with IPA, which will get rid of any excess ink left on the surface. After around a minute, you'll get rid of the excess and there'll be plenty left for you to see. And in case you were wondering, the Sharpie won't be removed by the normal cleaning process we used to get off any remaining paper and glue. Now the real beauty of this technique is that for our sublimation print profile, we can load in the model of the STL and then we'll have the same centering pattern on the print preview as well as the physical bed. 
to fully take advantage of this, I started adding centering registration marks to my sublimation images and that really helped me get everything perfectly aligned. Even if you don't have a spare build plate like me, you should still be able to print with the Sharpie in place with regular filaments. Okay, so now you know how to use this technique, but you might still be wondering, why would I spend the money on a 2D printer? What are some of the applications for combining sublimation with 3D printing? Well, firstly, remember that for a return on your investment, you can make and sell custom garments to order or any other products that typically use sublimation. These heat presses are very cheap on places like AliExpress. And if you're running an Etsy store for custom 3D prints, sublimation opens up whole new avenues. You could now produce all manner of custom items such as phone cases, printing on demand with customers' images. Honestly, who wouldn't want a customized phone case just like this? It's true, we can only color the first layer with this technique, but many people already buy beds with special patterns just to make that first layer better. And sublimation is much more versatile. We can now replicate any material we want, such as wood grain or perhaps carbon fiber, but we can still go further. For instance, when operating this animatronic face, I would frequently forget what controls did what. So to fix this, I headed back to the CAD, exported a DXF off the top surface, imported this into Illustrator, drew up some graphics, mirrored them from left to right prior to 2D printing, and used my grid system to match the positioning. The end result takes functional printing to a whole new level. And I'll no longer have to explain how this works the next time someone has a turn. And finally, we get great benefits by making our items truly 3D. Here we have a simple image which I've traced in Illustrator, and then exported that as a vector, which I then imported into Onshape, before giving it some thickness and building up a stand and supports. The end result is something my son loves. It's a custom piece that only he owns, and the integrated built-in stand works perfectly. You're probably wondering how durable the sublimation is, and the answer is extremely. Here I take another piece of the same plastic and I scratch it as hard as I can. I can also do the same thing with my fingernail, and as you see, no effect. We already know that this is waterproof, but what about something like isopropyl alcohol? Again, just like the water, this has absolutely zero effect. Once the sublimation takes place, it's well and truly bonded to the plastic and it should remain for the foreseeable future. I'm well aware that this won't be for everyone, but personally, I'm always looking for ways to expand the things that I can make, so this appeals to me greatly. Let me know if you feel the same way and if you're going to give it a turn. A huge thanks to Johan for both inventing the technique and making my pathway so much easier in making this video. Thank you so much for watching and until next time, happy sublimation 3D printing. G'day, it's Michael again. If you like the video, then please click like. If you want to see more content like this in future, click subscribe and make sure you click on the bell to receive every notification. If you really want to support the channel and see exclusive content, become a patron. Visit my Patreon page. See you next time.